We're going to start with hypoglycemia because it's actually gotten kind of interesting over the last couple of years, in fact, of what the things that can happen with hypoglycemia. Now, a couple of things you just know about sugar in general. Glucose is the energy source for your brain. Your brain doesn't use fats. It basically uses sugar. It needs sugar. So if you have a problem with dropping sugar, your brain is frequently affected. So you can have anything from just confusion um, to, frankly, you can have TIA symptoms. You can have a seizure. You can end up, it, it, all kinds of things can happen. It can mimic all kinds of things when, you're, when your sugar is low. So one of the things just to know about hypoglycemia is if anyone has anything that seems neurologic, they have a seizure, their altered mental status, they're frankly even in a coma, it is well worth checking a blood sugar. We can do it so quickly now, doing a finger stick blood sugar. It is a instantly reversible or quickly reversible, you know, event that somebody is having that can really have a significant impact on them. And you don't want people sitting around with no sugar in their body and their brain starving for sugar. So it can mimic a lot of things, but all of those things deserve a sugar check early just to make sure it's not something like, it's not a stroke, it's actually somebody who has hypoglycemia. It's not a seizure, it's actually somebody who's hypoglycemic. Um, and definitely cases of altered mental status, this should get checked. So it can mimic a lot of things and anybody with altered mental status or a seizure should have their sugar checked. Um, your body also has other hormones that help keep your sugar sort of out there. Glucagon and epinephrine help release sugar as well. So we know that we have, your body does lots of important things to try to balance your sugar level, um, including insulin, which we'll get into, which is a big one. But when you're, when you're, um, when you're hypoglycemic, your body doesn't like it. And so the things that you get are not just mental status changes, but it also tries to get your sugar up by releasing epinephrine. Um, it, it releases glucagon as well, but it tries it releases epinephrine and to try to get some sugar out there as well. And the symptoms then that people get when their sugar drops are things that are hyperadrenergic. So they end up sweating, pallor, tremor, um, vasoconstriction, anxiety, they get nauseated. All of that goes with, as their sugar is dropping. And what is interesting is if, say, someone is a diabetic and a hypertensive who's on a beta blocker, if they're on good doses of beta blockers, as much of them are, the tachycardia part will get masked. They might, may not get tachycardic. And beta blockers also decrease tremor. So they may not get the tremor that goes with it either. So some of that sympathomimetic stuff that we would expect from all the catechol and epinephrine out there, we may not see in somebody who's in a beta block, on a beta blocker. So just keeping that in mind. Um, and they will get dizzy. They may actually, frankly, go a little wacky. People can really get psychotic. I've seen several patients in my career who were thought to be having some sort of psychotic mental problem that completely went away when their sugar was brought back up again. Um, confusion, coma, all of that can ha you know, happen. So anyway, unresponsive, altered mental status, or seizing, please check a sugar. It's an in easily reversible thing. Why do people get it? So the most common, 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 common is meds. It's meds that we give people. The insulins and some of the oral meds that they get can drop their sugar because they may not be eating. They may be exercising more than they have before. They can end up with a, a low sugar. Alcohol, which is a great sort of carbon energy source is not a good sugar source. And if you drink alcohol a lot over time, your glucagon stores go down. So especially chronic alcohol use, hypoglycemia can be a problem. Certain drugs can do this. I mentioned insulinoma, which is rare, can happen. So every once in a while, somebody has a tumor that releases insulin and that can happen. Hepatic disease. So somebody has ba a bad liver. They may not have good glycogen stores. Somebody's undernourished, um, may not have good glycogen stores. So they don't have enough sugar to actually kind of you know, mobilize in their body. Steroids can do this. So people who basically um, have decreased their steroid taking, they can end up with hypoglycemia. B babies that need sugar a lot, actually, as they're growing infants, tiny ones, can get hypoglycemia. There's just a lot of sepsis for sure. And I'll tell you, one of the things that can cause hypoglycemia is dumping syndrome. So people who end up, um, particularly bypass surgery patients, who maybe just have a temptation to have a little too much sugar load, um, so they eat a bunch of sugar and they get a huge insulin rush to try to drop that sugar and they end up with dumping syndrome where they end up just feeling great. They get that whole catechol thing that drops their sugar. Um, so that is low sugar. And then there's artifactual things. And so let's say it's a super busy day in the ER. Blood gets drawn and it gets left on the counter for a while. 
and oh gosh, somebody finds it later and sends it to the lab, but it's been sitting there, especially if there are a lot of white cells in there, especially if it's like a lot of white cells, like a leukemic, it can chew up all of the glucose in the tube. And so it measures low because those white cells in the tube have chewed it all up and used it all up. So that's artifactual. Um, that tends to be people with high white cells or high red cells. So the polycythemic person or the leukemic are the people that get hypoglycemia artifactually. Fixing it is relatively easy. You just have to recognize it in the first place and then we fix it. And we fix it by giving oral glucose if possible. So people who are diabetic know they carry around that little paste, they have a hard candy, they have orange juice, something that has pretty high sugar load easily absorbed, and they end up bringing up their own sugar. So if possible, you can have people eat something that's a high sugar load. If not, you can give them a bolus of something. So you can give them, you know, IV D D50, you can give them. You can give them D10 IV if you need to. If, if you can't give oral, you can try that. Glucagon, which again, tries to mobilize those glycogen stores in your body, in your liver. Um, you can give glucagon. That's not as effective. Um, IV is better than IM if you can. Uh, and it's not quite as effective in, and certainly not as fast at bringing up the sugar as giving somebody actual sugar itself. And interestingly for children, we know that the fluid that we give children who are hypoglycemic, if you're giving IV fluid, ranges. So if it's an eight-year-old or higher, I can go ahead and give D50, that's fine. But as they get smaller, like from two months to eight years of age, I really can't give D50. I need to give D25, but how much do I give? And I know the little tiny guys, if it's a, you know, a four-week-old I need to give sugar to, I know I'm supposed to be giving D10, but how do I know how much? There's a great little trick called the rule of 50, and basically what you wanna do is take the concentration of D times the number of cc's per kilo, equaling 50. So if it's a, a D50, it's one cc per kilo, 50 times one, that's 50. If it's D25, it's two cc's per kilo, 25 times two, 50. If it's D10, it's five cc's per kilo. Again, this is age, the age break off is two months or younger, two months to eight, eight or older. So they, again, 10, if it's D10, it's five cc's per kilo, 10 times five is 50. Great little trick to remember based on the age of the kid, what you give them as far as the fluid to give them that bolus of sugar that they may need. Now there are special situations. I say you treat it and the sugar comes up, but then they go back down again. Their sugar drops again. Oh wow, what do I do with that? So sometimes you need to put them on a drip. The drip we use is D10. So you use just a D10 drip to kind of keep that. If it keeps dropping, it keeps dropping, or they've overdosed on something, you may need to keep sugar in their system and you may need to use something like D10. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a minute because if that happens, you should be worried about particularly a certain class of agents that keeps people's sugar keep dropping. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, if you think it's adrenal insufficiency, so you have somebody who's hypotensive and oh gosh, their sodium is low and their potassium is high and they've been on chronic steroids and their adrenal system has been suppressed and you think that's why their sugar is low, give hydrocortisone um, or even decadron actually. You can give, you can give dexamethasone that can basically help bring their sugar up for adrenal insufficiency. Now, if you have somebody who keeps dropping their sugar and dropping it, give it, it's all better. They wake up and then they get loopy again and you give it and it comes up and then they get loopy again. Their sugar's going like this. That is often related to a sulfonylurea ingestion either an overdose or just a regular ingestion with somebody who hasn't eaten enough. Sulfonylureas so make you secrete insulin. So I now, I already have too much insulin going on. I get my sugar too low. Okay, now you give me sugar. I release more insulin because you gave me a sugar load. It comes up for a second, but then it drops again. It just is this cycle that can happen with sulfonylureas. There is an antidote to that, which is octreotide. Same octreotide we use in GI problems, same dose, frankly, we use in GI problems. If you have any question, look up the dose, but it's basically, if, you, if you're comfortable using it for things like varices, you're comfortable using it for this, the key is to recognize it. And again, it's that person who takes oral agents, they may not even know which ones, but their sugar drops and you give them sugar and it drops, give them sugar and it drops, that's suggestive of a sulfonylurea. Now, it is it is people who, that again, the big cause of this are agents that people take for their underlying diabetes in the first place. Those agents come in two classes. Classes. So one is what are called the hypoglycemic class. Uh, your sugar is high, I drop it down. The other is the anti-hyperglycemic. I never let your sugar go high. So it's two classes here. The hypoglycemic agent, again, my sugar is high, I'm going to bring it down. That's where the sulfonylureas live. So what they do, and, that, and this is the chlorpropamide, the gliburide, the, we're used to these. These agents have been around for a long time. 
what they do to your body is they stimulate pancreatic insulin release. So I'm a particularly type two diabetic, my sugar is always up. To bring my sugar down, to get me down, my, my glycemic level down, I need something to increase insulin coming out of my pancreas, that's what these agents will do. The problem is, if I take too much of this thing, it causes a profound hypoglycemia and they have a really long half-life. So they do that thing where sugar drops, I give more sugar, it comes up, they wake up, they go back out, their sugar's down, they, they do this cycling thing. That is the sulfonylurea overdose or the sulfonylurea, you know, taking too much, either intentional or not eating or just too much sulfonylurea. That is the octreotide patient to use, or to, to, the octreotide situation to be used in, again, that undulating sugar that keeps dropping. There's also um, other agents in this sort of drop your already high sugar category, um, but the big one is sulfonylureas. And again, for us, that ends up being a, a problem because this can last for quite some time, this hypoglycemic risk, because somebody has an agent that has a 24-hour half-life, you know, really long half-life. That's the hypoglycemic diabetic treatment sort of category. The other category is what's called the anti-hyperglycemic, meaning I'm not gonna let your sugar go up in the first place. I'm gonna, we're gonna basically get you down to a level where it needs to be, and then it's, we're gonna keep it there. We're gonna not let you go up. And there's several ways to do that. So we have metformin, which has been around for a really long time, and that cause, can cause a lactic acidosis. It's really minimally problematic though. That agent's pretty darn safe. We have the, the a category I cannot pronounce that includes the drugs like Actos and Avandi. I can never pronounce that thing. I'm not even gonna try. Um, that can worsen some congestive heart failure problems. Uh, there aren't a ton of people on that particular class of agents. But the two classes of agents that we're seeing all the time now, because they've become not just really good diabetes control medicines, they're also now being used for weight control for people, are the SGL2 inhibitors and the GLP inhibitors. So let's first talk about the SGL2 inhibitors. And why are these considered um, anti-hyperglycemic agents? Like what is it that they do that keep your sugar from even going high in the first place? Well, what they do is they decrease glucose resorption at the kidneys. So your kidneys actually resorb kidney, resorb glucose. Your kidneys basically will suck it right back into your system. They do that pretty efficiently, frankly. What these agents do is make you pee it out instead. What they mean for us clinically is two things. One is it causes a glucose urea. So this idea that people used to watch their blood sugar, you know, their sugar control by seeing if they were spilling into their urine. Now people don't do that, they do finger sticks. It's much better to know what's in your blood that's in your urine. Um, but now on purpose, this agent is having them pee out sugar. So these people will have a dip positive for sugar. So that's important to know. The other thing that's important to know is the complications of this that we see make sense in somebody who has now sugar that they're peeing out. So we tend to see genital fungal infections more commonly, or because it draws out fluid as well, people can get an osmotic diuresis with this and can get a little bit hypotensive. So that's the two main things we see with this class of drugs, the SGL2 in inhibitors. And these basically, again, they keep, they're anti-hyperglycemic. They prevent you from getting hyperglycemic. The other huge category, and this is a gigantic category, is the GLP-1s. These are the ones that are being used for weight control all over the place. And the weight control doses and the diabetes control doses are different, but there are now, oh my gosh, a half a dozen of these out there in different doses for depending what they're doing. What the GLP-1s do is they do two things. They do increase your insulin release. So they do that, again, like the, like the, oh, the sulfonylureas do, but not quite as dramatically. They do increase your insulin release, but at the same time, they block glucagon. So you don't make any more sugar with glucagon. You produce insulin to drop what sugar is in there and drop it down. And then on top of that, they slow your stomach emptying so you have a more feeling of satiety. So people just don't, they're not as hungry. They just don't eat as much. They're just not as hungry. And in fact, that is a pretty sustaining thing that people will notice. But with those as the things that it does for people, that it, its actions, you can see why some of the side effects are what they are. We tend to see things like, like emesis, so people are, or gastroparesis, not gastroparesis, basically problems gastric emptying, so they can end up with vomiting that comes with it. So that actually is probably more common than people will admit. Um, these agents are being used for weight loss. People like losing the weight. They lose a lot. They lose a sustained 10% of their body weight if they take this stuff. It's, it's pretty impactful. So they may not mention that they're vomiting, but it can also cause pancreatitis. So just know, because again, it's working at the pancreas by increasing sort of the insulin release, et cetera, 
it, it can cause pancreatitis here. And also, people do spill sugar. So it can cause genital infections as well. And this is the biggest class that's being used as weight loss drugs right now. It does not cause, though, hypoglycemia, much less likely. Same thing with the um, SGLP um, inhibitors as well. So hypoglycemia is just not as common at all in these folks. And it's pretty good at keeping the sugar under control going on the high end as well. So they work pretty great. We don't tend to see sugar problems with these agents. We see other kinds of problems with these agents. And there's another category as well out there. Just know it's gotten a little complicated. It's no more just the insulin, is it short acting or long acting, and sulfonylureas. There's now a bunch of categories. It's just these newer categories tend to affect what we see sugar-wise less dramatically. It does cause some other troubles though, which we'll talk about. So hypoglycemia, a few pearls. If it's a sulfonylurea overdose, like somebody is on the long-acting agent sulfonylureas and they are hypoglycemic, really plan on admitting that person. That duration of that drug is really long. The half-life is 24 hours. So to get it totally out of their system is days it takes. So that person often needs to just get watched, at least at OBS, to make sure that their sugar sustains higher on their own not with you giving them something, but with them actually being able to just eat and then keep that sugar up sustained. So that, so be careful with those folks. And if they have recurrent hypoglycemia, you're gonna treat them with octreotide. If a patient seems malnourished and they need to get glucose, we were all taught, give thiamine before you give glucose, give thiamine before you give glucose. Those of you who are younger who may be watching this particular video, you may not have had that dictum thrown at you like some of us are older did. The theory was you didn't want to precipitate something like, you know, Wernicke's or Korsakoff's to so somebody who basically got a bunch of sugar and was thiamine deficient. It turns out thiamine deficiency is pretty hard to get super deficient, and it happens. It mainly happens in people who are alcoholic and only drinking alcohol, not eating anything, or people who are malnourished like older people with difficulty with access to food, um, or anybody who has difficulty in access to food. So they're just malnourished. They don't have good nutrition. That person can be thiamine deficient. So in those cases, consider giving thiamine before you give some sugar and somebody's hypoglycemic, or at least simultaneously. It doesn't have to be exactly beforehand. As long as it's around, you're not going to precipitate anything. Um, and then if somebody is hypoglycemic, glucagon don't count on a lot. It can be effective, but it may not be, especially by the way, that same malnourished group may not have gluc gluc glycogen stores at all. Glucagon works by mobilizing glycogen stores. So if they don't have it, it's not going to work. So don't count on a lot of effect in certain patient populations. So that's hypoglycemia.